all hope you're well. To today's lecture is on euthanasia. Not really a ton to go over. We've just got a couple short essays. The first one, James Rachel, Stuart Rachel's father, who's the anthologist of our book. Actually, James Rachel's was the original anthologist. Um, he, uh, Rachel's himself is arguing for euthanasia in favor that at least in some cases it's it's not only not the wrong thing to do, it might overwhelmingly be the right thing to do. Um, he himself died of cancer um, in 2003. Um, interesting, though, I want to point out this uh, intro by um, his son, Stuart, where he says, uh, I'm looking here on page 348, James Rachels himself died of cancer in 2003. At the end of his life, nothing persuaded him to change his views view of euthanasia, but he did wonder whether, hey, baby Huey, okay, um, he did wonder whether the argument for mercy would require less intentional killing than he had thought. Often a humane death occurs when a patient is given more and more pain medication, administered in order to relieve pain. Under such circumstances, the intention to kill is unnecessary. So I want to point out that in this country, what... Um, it might appear to be uh, euthanasia takes place thousands of times a day in hospitals all over this country. It's not euthanasia. What happens is typically uh, somebody who's terminally ill, often with cancer, um, becomes, uh, if you continue to take opiate, opioids, you build up a tolerance to them. Uh, there comes a, a critical point where the amount of opioid needed to relieve the pain is insufficient to actually relieve the pain of the patient. And what a physician will do in those cases often will administer amount of opioid that he or she knows will, or, or uh, uh, she, he or she believes will bring about the death of the patient. They will administer that anyway. Well, how is that not euthanasia? Because the object of the of administering the, the painkiller is to relieve pain. It, the object isn't to bring about the death of the patient, even though secondarily, often the death of the patient does occur. So I want to point that out. So it's technically not euthanasia because, again, the object is is a to relieve pain, not to bring about the death of the patient, even though the patient often does die. And that's what Rachel's is talking about there. Um, first one is the argument from mercy. And this is, a, uh, as he says on 348, an exceptionally simple argument, at least in its main idea, which makes one uncomplicated point. Terminally ill patients sometimes suffer pain so horrible that it's beyond the comprehension of those who have not actually experienced it. Their suffering can be so terrible that we do not even like to read uh, about it or think about it. We recoil even from the description of such agony. The argument, that mercy, uh, the argument for mercy says euthanasia is justified because it prov provides an end to that. And, you know, a, a similar analogy is what would we do uh, with a dog or a, an animal uh, that's in severe pain? Typically, a, a, a compassionate person will take the dog to the vet and have that dog put down. Why don't we show that same amount of compassion for people? That's really what the argument from Mercy centers on. Um, look at page 349. He talks about, um, he quotes Stuart Alsop, uh, who was a journalist who died in 1975 of a rare form of cancer, but he relates the story of his roommate there. And that'll give you a sense of, of maybe what some of these terminally ill patients endure. Um, okay, page 350, the utilitarian version of the argument. Um, here I'm just going to say that this argument reflects Bentham's utilitarianism in the sense that it's concerned exclusively with interests and not rights. So you can look at that argument, uh, short three-step argument on the bottom of 350 and the top of 351. Um, uh, Rachel thinks that this argument fails, that this argument is not sufficient to show that euthanasia is morally permissible. But he does offer, uh, so while he thinks the utilitarian version fails, he offers what he thinks is the utilitarian-inspired uh, 
version of the argument from mercy on page 352. And I would argue that this reflects better uh, John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism in that it does take into account the rights, not only interests, but also rights. So it's a difference there um, between Mill and Bentham. So uh, the first argument that uh, Rachel thinks fails is the straightforward Bentham utilitarian argument. The argument he thinks that succeeds is the utilitarian inspired argument that I would argue reflects uh, Mill's utilitarianism. Um, page, uh, chapter 38, The Wrongfulness of Euthanasia by J. Gay Williams. Williams offers here, uh, um, she, he or she, the, the name, uh, J. Gay Williams is a pseudonym, we're not told the identity of the real author, and I remember several years ago, Williams uh, uh, wrote a few things on this issue, and as far as I know, we don't know the, the true identity of this author. Um, Begins by talking about Karen Ann Quinlan. You probably are too young to, to know who Karen Ann Quinlan was, but a uh, very controversial issue in the 1970s. Um, Quinlan, 18, 17, 18 years old, went to, I think, a, a high school dance, took a couple Valium, uh, drank some beer, and fell into a, a, a comatose state, vegetative state. And... The issue was whether one, whether it was morally permissible to take her off of her, uh, you know, um, uh, machines that were kept that kept her living, even though she was in a uh, uh, state, a vegetative state. So that's what that reference refers to. But Williams argues really um, offers three arguments: a Kantian argument and a utilitarian or consequentialist argument. Bottom of 353, top of 354. Uh, he says, I want to show that euthanasia is wrong. It is inherently wrong. Kant, wrong in itself, regardless of the consequences. But it's also wrong judged from the standpoints of self-interest, also Kantian, and of practical effects. So even the consequences of a society that allows the permissibility of euthanasia will have some very undesirable practical effects. Um, I'm not going to go through all of, of this here on 354. Uh, some of this we've already touched on with respect to Rachel's. Um, but page 355, uh, the argument from nature. And the point is here is that really euthanasia goes against our, uh, uh, our natural living, driving force to live. Every cell in our body seeks to survive. We, as you know, uh, or organisms ourselves, also have this drive of self-preservation. Uh, so Williams will argue that euthanasia really goes against that natural living driving force. Uh, the argument from self-interest. Um, uh, and this is the idea that, you know, maybe there'll be an 11th hour miracle that could save your life. Um, maybe there's a misdiagnosis. Those do happen, and you would avail yourself of euthanasia when you weren't as sick as they said. Um, but I do think he makes a good point with respect to the bottom uh, on, on 356, with respect to the concern for others. And I think this is the strongest uh, argument he makes. Idea is, is old, you know, old Uncle Fred is in the nursing home. The family is, you know, uh, uh, paying a lot of money for his care. Um, Fred is, is not well. He might be terminally ill. His life doesn't seem that great. Family visits him every week, and is, they, they are too are emotionally taxed by this visit. Fred, old Uncle Fred, might avail himself of euthanasia, not because he wants to die, but because he wants to spare his family the upset and the turmoil he sees them going through. So he might, though he wants to live, he might be inclined to avail himself of euthanasia for out of concern for others and not himself. And I think um, I could certainly see that happening, and that's a good point that Williams makes. Finally, the argument from practical effects uh, talks namely, uh, uh, mainly about the slippery slope. Uh, 357, a person apparently hopelessly ill may be allowed to take his own life. Then he may be permitted to deputize others to do it for him, should he be no longer able to act. 
judgments of others then become the ruling factor, so on and so forth, uh, on page 357. And when I think of the um, uh, slippery slope argument, you know, what is a slippery slope? A policy that's intended to help some people with some issue might, um, un, un, uh, uh, one might not see that the policy might be used in ways it wasn't intended for. I'll give you an example. Say euthanasia is deemed appropriate for people with terminal illness. Technically, diabetes is, is considered a terminal illness. If you have diabetes, you probably will die of diabetes. Uh, that might not be till you're 95 years old because the, the disease is so well managed. Well, 20-year-old who gets depressed might say, look, I have diabetes, I have this uh, terminal illness, I'm, you know, by law allowed to avail myself of euthanasia. Certainly not what the law was intended to uh, 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 to apply to. Um, so look that over. Um, definitely read this last paragraph on 357. Um, uh, but I think that's it. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, uh, uh, take care and stay well.